Today we are going to finish up our story of powering the stars. And then we are going to start looking at the only thing we have to study the stars, which is light. So we need to understand how in the world we take some dots of light in the sky and make sense of what those, those objects are actually doing, what they are, where they're headed, what they say about our own solar system. Um, that's the goal in to for today. Before we get there, did anybody see the, uh, any, anybody from last semester, I wanted to point out that um, there was a meteor that crashed into, or crashed over Berlin yesterday. Did anybody see this headline? Pretty cool. So they, they actually, some, some astronomer hanging out at an observatory detected it at a full 75 minutes before it, it landed. And it, they issued a warning for this city of Berlin. Turned out to be a really, really tiny asteroid. It was something like less than a meter, completely burned up in the sky. But we, we talked a lot last semester about trying to predict these things. And so, you know, I think NASA is tracking everything that's over a kilometer right now. At least they're very close to getting everything over a kilometer. So the fact that some guy found one that was a meter, a full, more than an hour ahead of time, is actually quite promising. Uh, so that was cool. I think people were quite nervous, who, the people who got the warning, but it turned out to be a, a bit of a, what would you say, overexcitement over nothing. Okay, so I have a lot that I want to talk about today. Uh, let's do a bit of attendance review first. Um, again, I'm just going randomly through this list, and I will call on you, and you're going to tell me something interesting that you remember from last class, or a question you have, maybe something that didn't make sense, and we'll discuss it uh, very briefly here for a few minutes. Um, let's see here. Yeah, it seems to be a layered structure, right? There's a, there's a lot going on there. It's not, not as simple as what we see at the surface. And the story to how we got there seems to be that we believe that it, if it was just fire, right? If it was just, you know, let's say compressing itself like a, an engine, uh, it would burn itself out in a matter of millions of years. And so that's sort of insufficient. Um, all right, how about uh, Ethan, are you here? Good morning, Ethan. Yeah, there's, so there's a r huge range in the temperature of these bodies. That's what's really interesting. You say three, four hundred Kelvin. I mean, that would put it very squarely in the realm of being a, a brown dwarf or a, even a planet or something like that. And so we're going to talk more about that today in terms of what, what these colors mean. Because, you know, ideally, you can just look at something and tell its temperature, right? That, that would be really, really nice if that were the case. Uh, but this is a very idealized, uh, hopeful dream. Um, and it does allow us to classify the stars, and we, we can make some broad, uh, you know, we can make some broad analysis and, and bend them in a certain way. But we're going to talk about uh, some of the pitfalls of doing that, too. You know, for instance, uh, we've talked about black bodies a lot, right? Well, they don't call them black for no reason, because, you know, they use these soot-covered chambers which, of course, when he appropriately heated, will give off light that tells you the temperature according to the equations that, that we've, you don't have to know, but according to certain relationships, you can get the temperature. It's interesting, though, because the carbon cover, like when, when we say black, it's covered in soot, right? And soot, at, at the atomic level, has a particular lattice to it, right? It's actually a kind of hexagonal shape. It, it's sort of like the atoms are sort of arranged in this nice little hexagons all around it like this. And it makes a nice little crystal tiling structure of this, right? But what happens if you take that same chamber and you make it out of diamonds? Well, diamonds also have carbon. It's the exact same thing. The only difference is diamond is shaped like these little tripods, actually, kind of like this. And they stack them up, right? So it's the same material. And you can heat diamond to the same temperature but diamond doesn't absorb light at all. It doesn't emit light as a result, because anything that absorbs light is going to emit the same light. And so if you were trying to gauge the temperature of the diamond by, by its color, you, you would fail miserably. You would think it was, it was very weak and, and very, very cold, actually. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. It, it works as long as we assume that the stars are essentially all of the same structure. The, the atoms in them are the same structure as ours. So that's, that's a really interesting point. We'll play with that more. All right, let's do one more. Um, 
Yeah, so that, it's interesting, the composition, right? Like, what is that stuff? What is plasma, too? It's a very, it's an interesting word, because, uh, you know, we say the sun is plasma. Um, the weird thing about the word plasma is that it seems to encompass so many different states of material, right? Uh, we can't, it's very difficult for us to, you know, with a straight face, say the sun is a gas purely because we don't get that beautiful rainbow of color from gases when, when we heat them, right? We get just individual lines. Um, we talked about this last, last class and um, last week to some extent. The plasma word is interesting because plasmas can vary the gamut, right? Plasmas can be, they're finding plasmas in liquids now, there's plasmas in gases. It really just means a conductive sort of um, ambiguously hot state of matter, right? It's, it's very ill-defined. I think there's something like 11 different types of plasmas. So we've really gone full circle, and I think that's what, I, what I'm going to wrap up here now uh, as we move forward, is that uh, the Greeks were the first people, well, not, not in general, not like the people in general thought of this, but a Greek philosopher was like, hey, I think the sun isn't just the deity, I think it might be a burning piece of metal. Because he found a meteor on the ground, it was hot still, it was, saw it burning in the sky and thought, eh, that makes a lot of sense. Later on, you know, of course, dark ages, thousands of years pass, people are debating it. They see these sunspots, they think they're clouds, they start thinking about how the surface is moving. They've never seen anything like... Uh, uh, they, they don't have any sense of what else it could be besides a burning cloud of some sort. And, you know, there's all these arguments going back and forth across the 18th, 19th centuries uh, amongst the different scientists of the day, if you can call them that, say astronomers, people interested in this topic, writing letters, debating it. And nobody can come up with a satisfying explanation. If the sun is actually made out of gas then, and these sunspots turn out to be holes in the surface, well, why can't you see through the sun? Nobody has a good answer for that, actually. So it's, it's a huge problem. So there's this guy uh, who ends up really championing the idea that, hey, I don't know what the sun is made out of, but it seems like it's some sort of a liquid. Because that's the only way we're going to get that rainbow of color off the top of it. This guy's name was James Jeans. There was another man, however, who had a very different idea. And the difference that separated those two people out, we're going to finish up today. Um, but it really came down to the fact of how the stars were powered. Now, genes thought that the stars were powered because there was some sort of radioactive elements in them, like little nuclear bombs going off all the time, essentially. It was, it was a radioactive process. And nobody else had a better idea, right? The, I think the leading idea before that was that it was constantly getting hit by meteors that were just heating it up. Um, the contractile thing, like I said, didn't work. The piston engine thing didn't work because it, it uses up the sun too quick. So nobody had a really good idea for how the sun was powered. And this was a huge problem. And the guy who was advocating the liquid sun definitely turned out to be wrong when they discovered that the sun was made almost entirely out of hydrogen and helium, which are, of course, not radioactive elements. They're not big. They don't break apart easily. Like, you know, uranium and plutonium are some of the biggest atoms that we've ever imagined, right, we've ever seen. Um, so that didn't work. Uh, this guy named Arthur Eddington stepped up and said, I think I know how this happens. I think the atoms actually combine in this process is called fusion. And the fusion is what powers the sun. And he had a gaseous model for how that happened, and that ends up being what we're left with today. Now, what's really interesting, though, is that the whole thing has kind of gone full circle in some sense started off as this solid metal thing, went through this liquid thing, this liquid idea, went through this gas thing, and now we're at this idea of plasma, which is kind of this ambiguous, it's maybe a little bit of both, it's a little bit of everything, right? And so that's where we stand today. Um, now, to finish this up and make it even stranger, the material basis of the sun, there's a couple of pieces that we need to finish, fill in. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, surface features, right? So the sun has seismicity to it. It rings like a bell. It acts very much like, an ob like a solid body in some sense. It has, uh, it has surface features that change from time to time. It has cohesion. It has uh, little uh, spicules. It has these 
chunks of material that are thrown <laughs> off periodically, these coronal mass ejections. Okay, so what's going on with that? We'll look at it. And then, of course, at the back half, like I said, we're going to try to make sense of what the light can tell us from other stars, because that's where we're all headed, right? Um, we need to be able to deconvolve the light in order to make sense of how far away these things are, in order to make sense of, of what's different about the stars with respect to our stars. And, you know, before I launch into this, it's worth just taking a moment to try to understand why we're doing this. Because presumably the reason people are studying these things is because they want to make our lives better in some way. And you think, well, how in the heck does understanding stars make anyone's life better, right? And it's a really good question. I, I've had to think really hard about that one. Um, well, the, the obvious answer is, is Eddington's fusion idea, right? If we understand how the stars are powered, well, we'll be able to power our civilization. But I think there's more to it than that as well. I think that, you know, the fundamental uh, piece of being a human is trying to, in some sense, order all of the information that's flung at you all day long. And, you know, you get a real sense of anxiety when you don't have answers to the questions that you, that you ask. And so a big part of science is based in pure curiosity, but not in some sort of whimsical way. I think that it's really in service of making us a more sane people who feel like we have a grip on what's going on here. You know, we're each sort of born into this, this world and kicking and screaming and uh, trying to make sense of what's going on. And hopefully by the time you're an adult, you, you've, you've got a good grasp on things. And so the, this wider project is in some sense trying to make sense of where we, who we are inside of this universe with all of these strange glowing lights going on at night. What does it mean for us in particular? So along those lines, it's worth pointing out that all we're doing here in science, in astronomy, is we're making maps, right? We're making models based on what we know about the world that's out there, right? Now this is a map that was made before, you know, the great Columbus voyage to the New World. Um, and this is pretty much the way that most people in the old Mediterranean world would have thought about the world. This is the map they would have used. Now, look at this map. It looks preposterous for, sh for sure for us right now, right? But it worked for them at the time is the funny thing, right? I mean, they're basically sitting, they're basically cutting down trees and jumping on them and floating around in the ocean. And this works for navigating that small area that your ship's going to drift around through, you know? So is it a bad map? Not really. It works, right? But it's definitely not the most complete map. And of course, as people explored more, then we got airplanes, satellites, GPS. Now if I show you a, a good map, like if we pulled up Google Earth, right, you see it's an actual sphere. And you can go anywhere and you can zoom in and find surface features. You can probably find your own house, right? So map making improves with time. And a huge project here in this astronomy business is making a map of the world that we live in. Now, of course, it's our local neighborhood. We want to we understand what's coming at us. We want to understand where we might go in the future. But it's all a map-making process, and so it's, it is inherently incomplete, right? A lot of the ideas that we're talking about here today, particularly with regard to the sun, we're making a map of the sun. We're making a map of parts of the sun we can't see, we'll never be able to see. So they're entirely theoretical. We're trying to construct a layered, three-dimensional map of what's happening inside of the sun. Now, look, we've been working on that project for, you know, the fusion idea has been around probably 100 years now. That's nothing, okay? The people who built this map had been analyzing data of thousands of years in order to make this map. And it's still pretty crummy, I think you would agree, right? So, you know, an argument could be made it took the entire weight of human hi history, however many years that's been, I don't know, on the order of hundreds of thousands of years, to make the Google Earth map that we have today. A really long time of studying the Earth in order to make that incredible model, right? And it is just a model at the end of the day, right? So, as we go through this, we have to be really generous and really humble with our epistemology, with how we understand the world, right? With the, the, how we process all this data. These, these things that are written in your textbook, they're going to shift 
radically over the next 100 years. Over the next 1,000 years, they're going to shift unbelievably, and your textbook is going to look like this. That's the reality of the situation. That doesn't mean that our textbook's useless, though, right? This allows us to navigate in our solar system and make a lot of really smart choices. And so this project, this whole astronomy, astrophysics, science, the whole project is something that's on the move, right? We're map makers. But we have to keep in mind, we don't know everything yet. And so that's what I think is really exciting. That's what I'm trying to bring to light here in the course is something a bit that you won't really find in your textbook because, of course, you know, we're very proud people and we've done a lot. You know, we've, uh, we've got these incredible magical devices that allow us to pull up the whole history of the world and ev all the knowledge that's ever been generated at our fingertips. It's quite incredible. And we're very proud people. And we want to believe that we understand things very, very well. Um, but there are some fissures in our understanding, and I think those are really exciting because it means that that's where the work can be done in the future. So we're going to encounter a few of those today. All right, let's talk about more about what we know materially about the sun. Let's finish this out. So why is the sun a sphere? That's a really good question. Anybody? Yes? Gravitational forces. Okay, okay. Um, gravitational forces are half the battle. So let's say... Uh, Gravitational forces. I mean, that might be the whole picture. The way that it's, it's the, there's this concept called hydrostatic equilibrium that's brought in, into play. Um, so gravitation, gravitation is really just atoms pulling on each other, right? You get a bunch of them together, uh, they're pulling on one another. Okay, it makes sense that they're going to form into some sort of a droplet or something like that. Um, there's also these outward pressures from the sun, right? It's, it's heating, so it's, expand, it's trying to do this, it's trying to expand some. There's pressure from the inside from all these collisions that are going on. There's radiation pressure. There's convection pressure. So there, there is some outward uh, pressure from the inside. And that, of course, is being reined in by gravity. That's the idea. Now, all of the bodies in existence, all the celestial bodies, the planets, you know, the, the moons, these are all thought to be, the ones that are spherical are thought to be spherical because they're in this perfect hydrostatic equilibrium, this balance of gravity and um, outward pressure. Now, this, does, this kind of falls apart a little bit. There's some interesting exceptions. There's, a, there's a, some round bodies in the asteroid belt. I'm thinking of Ceres, for example. Now, Ceres doesn't have enough gravity to actually pull itself into a sphere, so nobody really knows how in the heck that turned into a sphere. And there's a few of these throughout. So it's not a totally universal uh, application, but that's the basic best idea anybody has for why the thing's a sphere. Um, let's see, what else can we say about that? There's uh, this process of heat transfer going on. We've talked about this a uh, fair amount in the back, uh, the last lecture. There's a few processes to that. So we have conduction, we have convection, and we have radiation. Does anybody know the difference between conduction and convection? Yes. Yeah, at the atomic level, it's more like one object kind of coming into contact with the other one and, and exciting it. So it's like actually a touch-based thing like that, right? What about convection? So convection is more like a group behavior. So it's like the warm group of atoms is going to rise up, right? And the cool ones are going to sink. So it's more like a, it's more of a group uh, behavior. Okay, so both of those are playing out. Those are, those are transferring heat from the ins inside where all these fusion reactions are happening uh, to the outside. This is the standard model, at least. There's also radiation pressure. So this is kind of shocking, maybe, if you haven't had much of a chemistry or physics background, but light carries a kick to it. You can actually shine a light on a sail in outer space and push a spacecraft around. So light has a push force to it. That's kind of interesting. It has some momentum inherently, uh, despite the fact that it has no mass. It has a push to it. So there is some radiation pressure coming up from within as well. Now that's very, very weak compared to the, the other two. So those are, our, those are three means by which there's a lot of churning. Yes? Can you repeat the uh, definition of conduction, please? Conduction? So conduction, let's see. I think collisions is the best way to think about 
uh, atoms and molecules colliding. Yeah, that's the best way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. So these, so this, this, all of these heat transfer processes are going to lead to some of that that surface features that we've seen, right? Those kernels, those. Uh, in, in some sense, um, the next thing we're going to talk about, which is that the sun has uh, this beautiful oscillatory behavior to it. It sort of rings like a bell, is one way to think about it. Um, it's interesting. It's like these. Each one of these little uh, pulsating nodes is something like 4,000 to 15,000 kilometers across. And they just sort of oscillate in and out. It's like it's breathing. It's very, very interesting. Now, of course, this may have something to do with the convection as it's rising as well and bubbling up and how these convection cells organize themselves with respect to one another. It's very strange, though. Again, this, this puts us into a weird uh, position when it comes back to the material basis of the stars, right? Now, these plasmas, what, this, whatever the sun is, this plasma business, seems to be able to do this kind of surface cohesion that allows it to, to have seismicity, right? To have surface oscillations in it. Gases can't do that, obviously. You can't have this kind of, you don't have a surface in a gas, first of all, but you don't have seismicity, right? You don't have wobbling inside of it in the same way, which is quite interesting. Now, you might in clouds, but clouds aren't just gas, right? They have little ice crystals and so forth as well. So there seems to be something more fluid about it, uh, about the nature of the sun that we can get from this seismicity, which is quite interesting. All right, and then finally, the last organizing feature, and we've touched on this before, is the presence of all of this conductive, uh, highly energized material at the surface which organizes all sorts of magnetic tangles, bundles of magnetism. Let's say the atoms organize themselves into these solenoid systems that we talked about in one of the earlier classes. And as a result of that, we get these, these, these uh, sunspots. Of course, as the magnetic activity of the sun becomes more or less coherent over the course of 10 years, we have these solar cycles, we get more or less sunspots. And so we have all these features to it. The stars are not featureless. They're not just these glowing balls of gas. They have so much uh, texture to them. Yeah? So uh, just correct me if I'm understanding this wrong. Uh, so sunspots are a direct result of stellar uh, tremors? Sunspots, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I think they're just another, uh, all of these aspects are pointing to the idea that, that, there's more to what's going on here than just a burning ball of gas. Okay, so they're not they're, directly correlated with each other? No, the, the sunspots are more of a magnetic business. These things are thought to be the results purely of convection. I, th I think convection does play into the sunspots because ultimately the sunspots open up a cold region in the center. Um, and the cold, of course, when you have cold, then you can have sinking. Um, and then when you have you know, you can get these convection cycles as a result of that. So I think that I'm sure they play into it, but they're not directly related. I think my, the bigger point I'm trying to make is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of material features on the sun and on all the stars, presumably, although, you know, who knows, really. But that's the presumption, is that if the other stars, particularly the ones that are the same temperature and mass as ours, they're probably very similar, and that's probably a reasonable assumption. Yeah? Uh, Yeah, yeah. So we fortunately have time for an entire deep dive into all the different star types. So we'll get to those. So hang on to it. Um, I mean, the, big, the first challenge before we get there is that how do we know that we're looking at a star that's a dwarf star and not just a star that's really, really far away? That's a really, really hard thing to do, it turns out. It's not a simple task. Um, so we need to figure out how do you look at a light and tell if it's bright, really bright, or if it's just dim, or if it's far away. You know, these are very, very difficult things to separate out, so we'll have to spend some time doing that. Um, and we'll start here in just a second. All right. So I think that's, this is kind of the, this, we'll basically wrap this up. We'll, we'll stop talking about the standard interior model of the sun at this point, you know, I think that it's important, uh, this is, makes a nice transition into, uh, thank you for bringing this up, because we're, we're going to start talking about luminosity now. You know, 
like I said, there is this huge rivalry between these two guys. And I've said that the reason that uh, this gentleman over here won, won out was because he had proposed a very useful model for fusion. Well, useful, at least seemed theoretically promising. Nobody's really pulled it off in any appreciable sense so far on Earth. But there's something else about that guy. He came up with this relationship, right? Now, this relationship uh, is essentially comparing the luminosity of any given star you want to ours, our stars. That's the L with the little circle at the bottom. So that's in relation to our sun. Whenever you see that dot with a circle around it in astronomy, that's our sun. Sometimes you see a, dot, a circle with an X, that's our planet. So this one's, uh, we're going to compare the, the mass which we can get. One sec, I'll be right with you. We're going to compare the star's mass to our mass, and then we're going to compare our luminosity, which is known. We can measure that easily since we're close by and we know the distance to the star's luminosity. Now, we can determine the mass of a distant star based on the way that it's orbiting with other stars, generally speaking, right? Because, you know, unfortunately, all of you weren't in the class last semester, but we very easily walked our way uh, how people came to the conclusion that you can determine mass as a result of orbits, right? How fast, how far something is orbiting. It tells you how big it is, essentially, how many atoms are there. Yes? Yes, this is the mass, this is one of, the, I would say this is the most famous equation in all of astronomy, actually. It's called the mass-luminosity relationship. Okay, now, this, in some sense, as we're going to see, is the holy grail of relationships, because luminosity, now luminosity, what is that? Okay, when you look at something, like I said, it's bright, but I don't know if it's really bright, or if it's just really close to me, for instance, right? If I put my face right next to this lamp, I'm going to think that it's really, really bright. But if I stand over here, it's not too bad. Okay, so brightness is a different concept than luminosity. Luminosity is how much actual light power per unit area that thing is putting out. Okay, so if we can know the luminosity and we... If I know the actual luminosity of this light over here, I can calculate based on, you know, how that, those rays dissipate over time. I can calculate how far it is away from me. That's really powerful, actually. But how do I know how really bright it is? Well, this is how we know. We know because the idea underpinning it is that something that's bigger is going to be burning more stuff, for lack of a better word. I know it's not actually burning, but let's say it's powered by more atoms, right? It's going to be a bigger ball of luminous material, okay? Now, it's a little bit squishy. So even as it's written right now, it has this interesting little alpha parameter up there in the corner. So you see alpha parameters a lot in physics, actually. An alpha parameter is a sort of situationally dependent variable. And what this means in this case is that depending on what type of star it is, we change the number that goes in the multiplier up there. And this is in order to fit these nicely on a, all of these masses to luminosities on a line very nicely. So it's squishy a little bit. It's tunable. It means you can sort of adjust it depend so it'll fit the data very nicely, right? So it's... it's it's not an absolute relationship across nature. There's another interesting assumption at the heart of all of this, too, which is that something which is the same size and has the same, uh, let's say, um, well, let's just stay with size. Something that has the same radius, the same mass, is going to be the same brightness all the time. This is based, of course, on this universal interpretation of black body radiation, right? It's sort of treating everything like it should be a soot-covered body. What happens if that star that's over there has a lattice that's, a, that's less like this and more like this, though, for whatever reason? Not that anybody's really, like, making that claim, but what if it is the case? Well, this thing's gonna, might be the same size, might be the same mass, but it's not going to have much luminosity to it at all, right? 
And this is something that isn't really factored into the mass luminosity relationship. So there's another hole, right? I'm telling you guys about these things not because this is like a worthless relationship, but just because it's not perfect, right? There's a lot of work to be done here. And, and almost the entirety of everything that's going to come downstream in this class assumes the mass luminosity relationship to be absolutely bedrock. Because that's the only way we know the distance to anything, essentially. Yes? You can, it's, it's a hexagon, yeah. Yeah, these would be like the this this would be, for instance, the lattice of a material. Lattice, thank you. lattice would be the word. Now, since the sun's material surface, its photosphere, the one that's giving us the light, uh, is considered to be this amorphous plasma. Nobody's really thinking about what its lattice structure is whatsoever, right? Because well, first of all, plasma is such an ill-defined term. Nobody's really thinking about it in material, ba in, in material sense at this moment. Um, I think that's a little scary, though, too, because, you know, like I've brought up over and over again, I think it's a really, really beautiful piece of the puzzle that's going to be developed in the next hundred years. May hopefully the next five years. Maybe one of you guys will do it. But that surface of that sun behaves like a perfect black body, just like those soot-covered chambers, okay? And... You know, this lattice that you get out of, uh, soot, out of soot, you see it in nature a lot, actually. It's a, it's a very common lattice arrangement. Um, you can actually get this, uh, you know, there's some evidence, let's say, that uh, layers of water will actually transiently produce these lattices under pressure, particularly at surfaces. So, you know, this happens, um, but nobody knows about the sun. All I'm saying is that the sun behaves as if it does have a lattice because it has that beautiful black body spectrum. And quite frankly, we, we don't see those from gases. So if it's, a it's purported to be a plasma, it seems like it's, it's a plasma that's more on the liquid side, at least of this ph photosphere. That's, what's, that's what seems to be apparent. I'm not sure that anybody uh, is really investigating that, at least uh, in the astrophysical community right now. Um, but there's some, there's some talk. So actually, I pulled a little quote here. So this is one of the leading... Uh, plasma physicist in the world, and she wrote this review kind of rethinking this concept of plasma. Um, her name is Bogart. And, um, you know, she said that, just she kind of rattled off this one line in this paper, which is a huge review, review of plasma physics at, at the moment. And she's like, hey, I, th I think we might be overlooking the role of liquid, liquids in plasmatic behavior, right? Now, you got to think, like, how in the world could a liquid be a conductive material, right? Especially hydrogen, right? Well, people didn't discover the metallic liquid form of hydrogen until, the 19, I think, 1935. And, and, and that was well after Eddington had won this debate, well after Jeans had retired, thrown in the towel, right? So the phase diagram for what could happen at extreme temperatures and pressures in terms of hydrogen's behavior, it wasn't known, but we'd already written that chapter of the history book. And what we're going to see over and over again throughout this course, and even today, is that what we like to do, well, that's a bad way of putting it, what happens a lot in science is that you kind of inherit these ideas from the previous generation. You go to school, somebody teaches you, kind of like, hopefully not what I'm doing right now, but you, know, you go to school and somebody says, this is how things are, and you say, okay, and you learn the theories, you learn the mass luminosity relationship, whatever. You learn this is how stars are powered, and you go and you build on it. You take that knowledge and you try to build something on top of it, right? Now, this is very, very effective. Actually, this is really, really good for building devices, right? Because if I have a computer processor that's kind of primitive, like an Apple IIgs or something like that, and I can figure out how to make it a little bit faster, well, that's productive, right? And maybe if I do that enough, and if enough students do that, we end up with an iPhone eventually, right? But science is weird, because with science, you just have these theoretical constructions of how things work. If, you, if there's something, and there always is, something a little bit wonky about your theoretical conception, and you keep building on top of it, and you keep building on top of it, at some point, there's nobody really in the position to be able to go back to the foundations and, and, and fix the little pieces that were wonky in the first place. So it's very, very difficult to change things once they've been embedded like this. And so anyways, 
the plasma chemists at least seem to understand that there, there may be some promise for a more liquid-like conception, at least of the photosphere. Now, that's really cool because I mentioned this last time that there seems to be some evidence that fusion may be happening not just in the heart of the sun. Um, and NASA has done a couple of studies with regard to this. It's, it's uh, well, to substantiate this idea, um, they've actually been able to do these fusion reactions at room temperature, which is quite interesting. And they do it by squeezing the little hydrogen substrates between something with a lattice, right? Now, how does that work exactly? How can you squish atoms together and, and fuse them without having to have these huge temperatures, right? Because remember, the tokamaks that they're using, that's the fusion reactors that they're trying to do these fusion reactions in for the most part, they're using temperatures that are thousands of times hotter than, than even the center of the sun, and they're still kind of failing at this enterprise, right? It's very difficult to control really hot gases like that. But what they can do with this lattice confined fusion is they can just squish a couple of atoms between these layers of metal, essentially, and, and hit them with a, a weak pulse of, of laser and it squishes them together. You might think, like, how is that possible? But it's kind of like this. Like, I used to play ice hockey when I was in college. Look, I was a little guy, relatively speaking. I played center. And I would always loathe when the puck would get thrown into the corner of the, of the hockey rink, right? Because I got to go in and dig that thing out. And the worst place to get smashed by some big dude is up against the wall in the corner of, of the ice rink, right? Now, I don't mind getting hit by people out in the middle of the rink. Why is that? Because I can just sort of like elastically kind of bounce off them, right? It's not a big deal. When you're forced into a corner, though, right, and somebody smashes into you, you take the full weight of that, of that impact, right? And I think it's something very similar happening inside of these lattice confinement reactions, right? Those atoms can't go anywhere when they get hit. They got nowhere to go, and they're too close to another atom, and they get squished together, and you get a fusion reaction, and you get some energy out of it as a result. So this is a really, really interesting uh, modality for achieving fusion. NASA is not talking a lot about it, which makes me think it's even more promising. Um, because if it, if it is the way forward, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of state secrets surrounding that. I've tried desperately um, on the podcast to, uh, with my wife to get in touch with these people. And they just kind of keep pushing us around to other people. And we've never gotten one of them to sit down and talk about it. So it's really cool stuff. So add to that Shabilsky star, which I think I mentioned very briefly last time. Now, Shabilsky star is really cool because... Of course, this is a star where the spectra from the star have indicated that there's these really big elements in the outer layer of the star, in the photosphere. Really big, heavy, radioactive elements that only last a few minutes. Okay? Now, how in the world do you get a, an element that only lasts a few minutes that's huge hanging out in the photosphere of a star if it's not being made there? Right? And the answer, of course, uh, is either aliens or there's some sort of fusion going on that we don't understand, right? And I, I'd probably tend towards the latter, although I, I hope for aliens just as much as everybody else. <laughs> so, I don't know. There's a, this story is completely unfinished. I have to move on from it at this point, but I want you guys to understand. The stars, you know, we treat them, we model them basically from here on out, as if they're burning balls of gas. But we know that's not true, for sure, right? The best we can say is that they're these, these luminescent balls of plasma. And we don't really have a great... Plasma is such an ambiguous word that we don't really know, but it does seem to have some sort of material basis. There seems like there might be some sort of a lattice going on that gives us that black body radiation. It seems like there's all sorts of seismic prominences, there's different features, the whole thing kind of rings like it's jiggling like a jello. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just, I, bef I just want to make sure that I, I leave you guys with the understanding that there's a lot more to be understood here about the material composition of the sun. It is far from a finished story. The fact that we call it a plasma underscores how ambiguously this is defined. And it's going to be a big factor as we go through <clears throat> and we try to make sense of things like white dwarfs, right? Or these giant stars. Because are we looking at something that's really tiny uh, but, you know, has a lot of mass? 
Or are we looking at something that's just not luminous because it has a different lattice structure and it has a lot of mass? I don't know. But as long as we're not thinking in those terms, right, in those, those terms, those material science terms, as long as no astronomers are thinking that way, these questions will never get answered. But I think they will get answered. Yes? So is the lattice on the outside surface of the sun more about lens or shade? <clears throat> well, everything has a lattice. So your skin has a lattice. The table has a lattice. Any solid uh, liquids have transient lattices that appear, right? Um, it just re represents like a, a stable bonding configuration for the material. So the question is, you know, the only things that don't have lattices are gases, right? Which is why you get these nice lines out of gases, because they only vibrate in a couple of directions, a gas, right? It can go, you can turn it any way you want. It can only vibrate in a couple of directions. So you get a couple of frequencies of light out of it. A table, like if I was to like heat this thing up, so, well, I wouldn't even have to heat it that that high, if we could see in the infrared, we could see um, this black body spectrum from the table. The table has an almost infinite series of frequencies it gives out because the table can vibrate in an almost infinite number of ways, right? There can be a vibration right here, right here. It can vibrate like this, like this. It can vibrate. These lattices can vibrate in so many different ways, right? And I'm talking about electronic vibrations, which is different than like, you know, displacements necessarily. We're talking about the actual electron shells of the atoms acting in concert in this resonant way. But solids and liquids have these unending articulation points, right? The, this, these lattices, there's like, you know, these things go on and on and on. And you can imagine that each one of these, you could have these two atoms interacting with each other and giving a certain wavelength of light. But these three could be interacting and giving another wavelength of light, and so on and so forth. If you have just a single atom, well, it's limited by what its own surface can do in isolation. So, look, what I'm saying is that the sun certainly behaves like it has, at least the photosphere, the surface, um, behaves as if it has a lattice. There's, no one's, of course, ever gone to the sun and scooped up, a, you know. So, this is very, very, very... Uh, what would we say, controversial. Um, and it's controversial because, well, we'll see when we get to cosmology why it's so controversial. Because, of course, one of the biggest, um, one of the other most perfect black bodies in, in astrophysics comes from the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the cosmic micro microwave background radiation is thought to come from this gas at the beginning of the universe, right? But if gases can't give black body spectra, then they're going to have to look for a new explanation for what that thing is. Because it's, it's not going to be from that, from that gas. So we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to cosmology. But it's, it's a very, very important topic, right? It's at the heart of so much discussion. All right, so let's start looking at, at light. Uh-oh. I guess I lost this. Let's start looking at light a little bit. Um, this illustrates the basic principle that I was talking about when I was talking about standing close to these lamps earlier. So, you know, we talked about this last semester. I'm not going to bother you guys with the math, but light and gravity, for that matter, both fall off with an inverse square of the distance, which sounds like a lot of math, you know, mumbo-jumbo, but here's the basic idea. Look, if you have an area which is close to a light source at, say, one unit of distance away from it, You've got, you know, four rays, and they're going through one little square area, right? If I go three times as far away from the light source, now I square three, I end up with nine. I have nine of those area units that are getting the same four rays, right? So the rays are split amongst nine area units. In other words, the light is diluted by a factor of nine. And that's the basic principle with light. So it's really nice because if you know the distance and you know how bright that thing is in the first place, oh, I'm sorry, if you know how bright that thing is in the first place and you know how dim it is, where, how you're actually seeing it, then you can calculate the distance from it, which is really, really important in terms of making that map for this place and figuring out where we're at exactly. Okay. It's a huge problem, though. So there's a few different methods for distance calculation. We'll get to them next week. Now, 
people didn't totally realize uh, the difference between luminosity, so the actual brightness, and how bright something looked. When the original astronomers were creating their star catalogs, in particular the Greeks, so there was this Greek named Hipparchus who, who set up this observatory on an island in the Mediterranean, and he cataloged something like a thousand different stars, and he ordered them by brightness on a range of one to six, okay? Um, where one was the brightest kind of star and six was the dimmest. Um, what's really interesting is, is people kind of went with it. Uh, so later on, people tried to add to this catalog and fit their own, their own observations inside of this. And uh, they did this successfully all the way up until, let's see. Oh, I, don't, I don't have it written down, but all the way up into, into the 18, 1900s, people were trying to squeeze their, their measurements inside of this one to six system. You know, and at some point, somebody said, well, is there an actual relationship between this? Because it seems like the, uh, it seems like the one is something like 100 times uh, brighter than the six. So what's going on there? So it turns out that the way that you deconvolve that is that each magnitude, they're called magnitudes, is 2.5 times brighter than the previous one. This turns out to be a, a fifth root system, which you don't need to remember. So a star that's magnitude 1 and a star that's magnitude 2 differ by, fact, that means the brightness of the 1 is 2.5 times more than the 2, and so on and so forth. Okay, well, you know, this... Uh, this became a problem because as we made more and more accurate measurements, we realized that there were things that were brighter than the magnitude one stars. And so we ended up kind of putting things after that. In fact, Sirius turned out to be brighter than a magnitude one star. Um, and Venus, of course, the full moon, the sun, we end up in the negatives for those guys, of course. Now, the moon, Venus, they're not stars, but they still get an apparent magnitude. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is, of course, seeing really, really far. But, you know, this is a bit outdated. We have the James Webb, which is seeing even further at this point. Really, really dim magnitude stars. You know, this is an interesting, like, I'm going to keep cycling back on this. This is an interesting case, and we'll see one more today before we close out, where people come up with some system for cataloging <coughs> some aspect of nature, in this case, the apparent magnitude, the apparent brightness, let's say, of stars, and it's a little bit broken, and instead of like clearing the chalkboard and like making a new one that actually makes sense, they just kind of add to it and squish it around a little bit, and we end up with negative magnitude objects and so forth. It's very bizarre. Uh, the next one's going to be the stellar classification system, which we'll get to in a second. The other thing that we get, other than brightness of a star, is we get its color, right? And I, I've talked about this a fair amount today already, but the hope is that all of the stars behave as perfect black bodies. And if they behave themselves as perfect black bodies, then we can get this beautiful temperature out of the curve that we see, out of the peak brightness, the peak color, right? Because as that, as that peak shifts, the colors are going to shift, right? So I can't really point here. And for, oh, I got a ruler, actually. Heck yeah. All right, so like this one, this 5,000K star is going to be redder right, for instance, than ours. Um, these ones are going to be so dim that you can hardly even see them. You're going to need infrared and so forth to see those stars. So that's the hope, is that, okay, if we know the color, then we know the temperature. Um, now, that's wishful thinking in some sense, like I pointed out, because it ignores the the ideal circumstances of those black body experiments that we've done on Earth, these soot-covered chambers. You know, it doesn't work out for most materials. The black body temperature is going to be somewhat, even if you do get a black body curve, it's going to be somewhat off depending on the material properties itself. You need these perfectly black chambers to do it. So maybe it's perfectly accurate for some stars. Maybe the, st maybe the stars do have a lattice that allows them to behave just like the soot-covered chambers. Maybe some of them don't, and so we're going we're gonna to be misled about those ones, which is an interesting blind spot. Okay, you know, actually, Max Planck, who came up with, um, who actually ended up finalizing this relationship. So it was this black body relationship between color and temperature was developed by a number of people, Kirchhoff, 
wine, and it was formalized and finalized by Max Planck. And Planck actually had this to say about it. He was very cautionary. He said, look, all I'm saying is that we, we, we are learning about the temperature of the rays that are coming off the sun. We don't totally know what's going off the sun itself. This is in his own words. He says, now, the apparent temperature of the sun is obviously nothing but the temperature of the solar rays, depending entirely on the nature of the rays, and hence the property of the rays, and is not a property of the sun itself. Therefore, it would not only be more convenient, but also more correct to apply this notation directly, instead of speaking of a fictitious temperature of the sun, which can be made to have meaning only by the introduction of the assumption that it does not hold in reality. So he's like, look, it's really wishful thinking that we can tell the temperature of these stars just by their light. I mean, it'd be really nice if we could. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. These temperatures are at best approximate and in some cases probably completely wrong, um, where, whereas we don't understand the material basis of the light that's coming from them. So here's you know, a good range of different stars from, from our, our local galaxy that we can see. And you can see the temperatures range incredibly. I think someone mentioned that this morning. Um, and if actually, if we add brown dwarfs and planets onto this list, I mean, add moons onto it, you're going to get down into the chilly, chilly, cold temperature region. So there's quite a range. Um, there's a few things we can do with this light as well, which is kind of interesting. So spectroscopy is, is the next level of abstraction in terms of analyzing light. Spectroscopy just means that we're taking a prism and we're breaking light into its component wavelengths, right? So white light, like for instance, this light above my head right now, above your heads, it has three different colors and it. it has a blue, red, and a green. And they're mixed together in such a way that it looks white to us, right? They're balanced very nicely. Well, you can do the same thing uh, with the light from the sun and that's how you get this beautiful rainbow, right? This black body rainbow. But you also are gonna be able to see these individual lines from the atmosphere because the gas in the atmosphere of the stars is absorbing some light. And so what we can do is we can use these gas lines to say something about what atoms, what elements are being cooked inside of the atmosphere. And this allows us to distinguish different star types to some extent. So that's gonna be a really important feature which we'll, we'll come back to. Can also tell us because these lines are affected by motion, right? We can learn something about how something that we just see, right? You just, you can't see stars moving. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever gone outside and looked at the stars. If you see a star moving, that's a satellite, right? So how do we know how the stars are moving? Because they're definitely moving. And it turns out that the way that those lines are affected is going to give us information about how they're moving. And that's what we're going to close down on here today. So the first thing people did uh, was they tried to find some way to order all of these different star types. Where do we put them? Now, this is the classification system that we're left with today. As you can see, it's, of course, totally preposterous. It goes O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and actually it continues down the line towards brown dwarfs at some point. Well, this is another instance of Somebody set up a system where they classified stars according to the strength of the hydrogen lines, okay? Which is the, the gas, the hydrogen gas in the atmosphere. How strong that signal was of those ionized hydrogens. And they laid it out, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. And that was a useful system for some, some time. And then people decided that, wait, 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 wait. I think the temperature is actually more useful. We should lay them out in order of temperature instead. And instead of changing the system, the system, they stuck with the old classification system, but they're ordered according to temperature. It's like you see this thing over and over again, and it's like, I don't know what it is about us humans that does this to ourselves. It's, it's like, kind of like the QWERTY keyboard, right? You guys know this about this, right? It's like, this is not the most convenient way to lay out a keyboard whatsoever. There's actually a guy on YouTube, I recommend, who, who tries out all these crazy different keyboards. And some of them are really, really fast. They're not laid out in the traditional fashion, right? The reason that we have this is because the typewriters are getting jammed and they wanted to slow people down. So they made the, the keyboard into this, you know, preposterous kind of inconvenient fashion where you had to search around to find the letters that you needed, right? They don't put all of the useful letters next to each other because people are typing too fast and breaking the typewriters. 
We don't use typewriters anymore. So why are we still using the QWERTY keyboard? Because we learned it that way, right? It's, what's that? Exactly, we get used to it. People got used to the, o the O B A F G. They got used to that, right? People get used to these things and they just kind of move on. And you know what? Most of the time that's not destructive, right? We're all typing on our keyboards. It's not a big deal. But like, science isn't a technical enterprise as much as people would have you believe. It's very theoretical. It's very much about trying to come up with conceptions of how nature works. So if you build on top of these things, you know, I think this, what I'm trying to say, this isn't a problem, fine. The classification system is a little bit, you know, chaotic. It doesn't really make sense. It's not easy to remember. But I think that it's ref reflective, it's symptomatic of, of a bigger chaos that's sort of pervasive of science, which is this building on top of old things that might not be such a great idea, but eh, they work, you know, we can build on top of them. But remember, we're trying to build those maps and we want to be able to travel further in our world, further into the stars. We want to understand more. We need to really, really reconsider the fundamentals, right? You know, when people, people built new maps, right? They didn't, they didn't just add on to that map that I showed you at the beginning of class, right? They eventually realized, oh man, we're totally missing. Uh, Australia's not, doesn't look like that at all, actually, right? But they didn't just like tack on some extra pieces to it. They rebuilt the map completely. And so, there's something profound happening here that, that, that's really illustrative uh, of how we can improve how we do science because ultimately, ultimately, what we want to do is we want to do science better in the next generation than we did in the last generation. So we have to be aware of these systematic failures that we're, we're very much subject to. Yeah. I mean, I do, I think there's revolutions periodically. So there's, you know, the, there's some philosophers of science who have tried to make sense of how changes happen. And it does seem that in many cases, what happens is that people think about the world one way for a very long time. And they're very, very resistant to changing their minds about it. Even in the overwhelming accumulation of evidence, right? The sun has a black body spectrum. Like, how are you telling me it's a gas, right? Even in the overwhelming face of the evidence, people will sit there and say, well, it's just the unique exception in the universe. That's just how it is. They did this with evolution. They did this with heat. Heat's one of my favorite examples, right? Because they used to think heat was a fluid that flowed through bodies. Until very recently, actually, um, until, let's say, I want to say in the 1800s at some point, when they started really working on engines for the first time. Now, that didn't make any sense because... What happened is people became aware that through friction, you could generate an infinite quantity of heat. As long as I sit here rubbing my hand on this table, it's going to stay warm, right? I'm never going to run out of heat from my hand. And so these, like, these contradictions pile up sometimes for decades, maybe, maybe longer sometimes. This happened, of course, with the Copernican Revolution. People were like, what are we doing here? Like, uh, you know, the Greeks knew, like, had the idea that in ancient Indian people had uh, in India not to confuse them with the Native Americans, the ancient Indians had the idea that the sun was at the center of the solar system. Like, it's an old idea, but people kind of didn't like it for 2,000 years in the West. Almost 2,000 years, say 1,500 years. And finally, it just became so, so, so overwhelmingly grotesque, the models that they were having to erect in order to, to keep things moving, that it collapsed. So what happens is these paradigms collapse periodically. And that's how change happens in science, right? seems to be, but it's a little bit tragic because it's, I don't know if collapses are necessarily the most efficient way for things to move forward, right? That's why I wonder, and that's why what I'm trying to, I know you guys aren't for the most part going to become scientists, so I think there's maybe one person in this room who will become a scientist, but most of you need to understand, what you need to understand going out into the world and doing whatever you do in your life is you're going to hear people use science all the time to persuade, to, you know, it's very much a political cudgel in some senses. Um, it's even treated with religious fervor sometimes. Believe in the science, right? <clears throat> These things really work against progress, and that's really dangerous, and I want you guys to understand that by the end of this class. Science isn't just some Bible of facts, right? It's a way of interrogating the universe, and we have to change our mind when the evidence starts to tilt, you know, not in favor of our pet idea. And that's really hard to do, 
And it's increasingly hard to do in the last 50, 100 years because for the first time ever, being a scientist is a way of making a living. It was never a way of making a living for the first two and a half hundred years of science, which was since the time of Galileo, right? These were just people who were kind of curious about how the world worked. They were already rich or whatever. They were, you know, lawyers, doctors, just wealthy inheritors, okay? So once your, your career is on the line, you don't really want to back down from your theory at all, especially once it's been published in some journal, it's major, you know, you got house payments, kids, whatever, right? It's a serious structural problem with the way that we do science, and I, and I want you guys to understand that, because maybe there's a better way. I don't know what that is, but maybe your generation will figure it out. Maybe there's a smarter way of going about this that doesn't make us so tied to our ideas, our theoretical ideas of how things work. So I think it's hamstringing us a little bit. You know, there was a really interesting uh, article that came out in Nature, which is, I think, probably the, the highest impact journal as far as science is concerned, peer-reviewed journal. And this article was talking about uh, how the rate of, of truly groundbreaking discoveries has been just plummeting over the last 50 years or so. Just absolutely nosediving. So why is that? And it's like, well, people don't want to step out of their box. And, and it's, it's not because it's they're not courageous. It's because this structure that we've erected for doing science in, it rewards these incremental steps. It rewards you saying, doing something akin to saying, oh, it's okay, we can keep the old structure, we'll just line them up differently and, and that's fine. It's that kind of mentality that's safe and, if, and, and in some sense moves things forward nicely that's rewarded by the present structures. So it's a huge, huge question, right? Um, and, and I think that I think there are people discussing solutions on the edges right now, but it's something for you guys to consider as you go out into the world, you know. Don't, 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 un, don't misunderstand what science is. It's, it's not a body of knowledge, okay? It's a discussion. It's always been happening. In some sense, the modern version of it where we actually try ideas out experimentally has only been happening for a few hundred years. But guess what? We can't do experiments in astronomy, right? You can't just grab a star and stick it in a test tube and control, do a controlled experiment and stuff, right? All we have is looking at stuff and making rational sense of what's going on with that light, okay? So, and there's a lot, that's not the only science like that. There's a lot of sciences where it's very difficult to do experimentation. I mean, you can do some tinkering, but you're not going to be able to get down and play with atoms, let's say, below the wavelength of light. You might be able to make inferences by, these, by experiments, but you can't directly interact with them, right? So there's a lot of science that just has to, we have to use reason, we have to use rationality, and we have to have open discussion and debate about whose ideas make the most sense. You can't just be shutting down people's ideas because, you know, they don't have the right, uh, you know, esteemed chair, or they don't have the publications in the right journal or whatever. All right, I'm done with that rant. Anybody have any questions about that? It's really, really important, guys. I mean, it's, I don't know how much you're going to remember about astronomy 30 years from now, but I hope you'll remember this much. Um, we, we have to be really careful because science is how we guide our civilization in some sense. It's how we make decisions. All right. So, like I said, there's a couple more spectral classes. If we go completely off the rails, we end up down here. We actually end up at planets eventually. We end up with these things called brown dwarfs first. Brown dwarfs, I, I can't remember if... We, we talked about them a lot last semester. I don't know. I think we'll have some time this semester to talk about them in more detail. But what's a brown dwarf? Brown dwarfs are kind of my favorite celestial body because, you know, you ever hear about, like, the missing link problem between, uh, like, the ape and the human for Darwinian evolution? It's like, where's the half? Anyways, they ended up finding a lot of those, actually. Uh, you know, the Australopithecines and all of that. But... The brown dwarf is an interesting missing link between planet and star, right? So the brown dwarf is essentially made out of all the same stuff as the star. It's just not quite big enough to ignite and fuse its hydrogen, right? So they're pretty big, and radius-wise, they're maybe only the size of Jupiter, and they got a lot more stuff crammed into that radius than Jupiter, but not enough to actually kick into fire, or whatever you want to call it. Not fire, but... <laughs> Bear with me. They're not, they're not glowing, right? They're not fusing. 
And so there's this interesting threshold, and it's thought that the way that brown dwarfs form is the same way stars form, except they just didn't get enough stuff. But there's this really interesting thought experiment I like to do too, which is like, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, so planets and, um, well, stars to some extent, you know, when they were trying to figure out how stars are powered, right? Why are they glowing? And they tried on this idea that it's like a piston in, in an engine, right? It's a compression-based thing. Um, that turns out to be a valid mechanism for generating heat. It's just that the kind of, the quantity of heat that you're getting off the sun is unimaginable. And if you were just getting it through compression, you would burn through the sun in like 100 million years. And people were looking around, this is right after Darwin, and people were like, I think the Earth's been around for quite a bit longer than 100 million years. Which was revolutionary at the time. I mean, talk about paradigm shifts. Most of the, these geologists were treating the Earth like it was 6,000 years old before that. Uh, that was not uncommon. So huge, huge leaps in understanding um, come, and they come often in the face of decades of accumulation of evidence and plenty of people standing around you know, being like, look at this, look at this, and people just won't look at it. Um, it's a really interesting feature of human beings that we can be led to believe, believe things that are against our best interests sometimes. I mean, it's, it's just really, really fascinating. My, my wife and I have been studying cults lately. You guys, you guys ever study? Yeah. Don't look up. Okay. Oh, I th wait, is it a drama? It's, it's a, a fictional. Kind of a situation where there's a giant meteor that someone discovers, and the entire uh, world is just like, don't look at it, don't look at it. Uh, yeah, it's nice. Okay. Oh, okay, so that, that author is trying to obviously. It's a really good commentary on her. You know, art's a great way, too, to talk about some of these huge, like, fundamental crises, too, because it's like, it's too painful, right? I'll, I, I've had the fortune um, with my wife and having this podcast to talk to a lot of astrophysicists about a lot of these issues. And it's really, really, really difficult to have these conversations. It's almost like too close to, it's like too soon kind of thing, you know what I mean? It's a little too close to like, it's a little too important to even come right out with it. But art's a wonderful place to talk about these difficulties. Because there's, you can be general, you can be fictional, you can be like, oh, I'm not really talking about you, I'm just talking about this other thing over here. Um, so, very cool, but... Yeah, I don't know what it is about human beings, but it's obviously part of our strength, too. I mean, the fact that we all can um, bring ourselves to believe, for instance, that it's a good idea to come to this class and, and study together, and we all believe, we all know how to behave. Like, you guys all know how to sit in these chairs and face forward. Like, no one's just turned around the other way. Like, people, we have these beliefs, right? Our ability to have coherent beliefs, the whole room believes the same thing in some sense. That's kind of amazing, and it seems to have actually led to a lot of what makes society and civilization incredible and, and healthy and good for us. But sometimes it just goes off the rails a little bit, right? Sometimes people get latched into their beliefs so much that they, that they get lost. And so the cult thing is a, is a really interesting example of that. All right, a couple more things to finish up here today. Um, from this light, so another hope, hopeful, is that, you know, I was talking about these gas lines in the atmosphere of the stars, right? These dark bands. Well, one hope is that um, as the stars are, if the stars are big and like huge and they have a great deal of mass, mm, that, um, and especially if all that material is crammed into a really little space, then there's going to be a great deal of pressure on the atoms in the atmosphere. They're going to be squozen really tightly by the gravity. Well, we know that if you put gases under pressure, those lines, those individual frequencies, it tends to broaden a little bit. What's that mean? It means that the atoms can vibrate with a few different extra. The frequencies can be kind of, you know, struggling a little bit. So it's a little bit of a spread around those central lines. Now, it's nothing like the rainbow of a black body, right? It's nothing like a solid object's infinite frequency spectrum, essentially. But you do get broadening. So the hope is, okay, well, that'll maybe tell us something about the, the size of these bodies as well. That's problematic a little bit because there's other processes besides this which can do it. And we'll look at one more today, uh, which is rotation. Um, but you also have chemical processes that can broaden lines as well. And so this is, again, very hopeful. 
Another thing we can get out of looking at these lines is something that comes from Doppler shifting, right? This is essentially the process. Uh, this is this is well. This is very similar to the way that the cops are going to clock your your car on the on the highway. The idea is that as something's moving away from you and it's emitting light, that as it moves away, there's going to be a little bit of a lengthening of that wave length, the distance between those peaks on the back side of it, and it's going to narrow a little bit as it moves towards you. I think this illustration captures it better than I can actually uh, put it into words for you. And what does that look like in terms of spectroscopy? It means that things that are moving towards you are going to have those gas lines in the atmosphere are going to be shifted a little bit towards the blue, as you see down here on the bottom, and they're going to be shifted a little bit to the red, as you see up on the top. And so we get a little bit of a sense of the motion of these stars. Which direction is it heading? Is it coming towards us, or is it going away from us? And then to kind of round that out, the last piece of information that we get from these things uh, is rotational information. Now, now, what happens with rotation, this is at least the hope, this is the theory, is that if something isn't rotating, well, all of its light is essentially of one particular line, one particular color, one element. It's coming and it's giving you a very sharp readout, one frequency, let's say. But if it's spinning, then there's some Doppler shift towards the blue over here on the left, the side that's coming towards you, some Doppler shift towards the red on the side that's moving away from you, and the result is that that frequency that you're measuring, it could be anything, let's say a hydrogen line, it's going to be spread out a little bit. Now how you deconvolve that from a pressure uh, broadening, you have to start thinking about what type of star it is, what temperature it is. It has to start to fit into this whole zoo of modeling that we've put together. And so, what I want you guys to remember is that these are the fundamental assumptions that we make as we build out the rest of the local galaxy going forward, the different star types going forward. We're going to, the last piece of the puzzle, which is going to take us a little bit of time to comprehend, is how we can be so sure of these distances. Because distances are everything when it comes to making maps. Otherwise, have a great week. I will see you guys on Thursday. By the way, let's do coffee hour again if anybody wants to come. I'll be here at 8 a.m. and we'll, uh, we'll hang out. Have a good week. <laughs>